Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the City Planning Commission review session uh, for Monday, March 2nd, 2020. The time is 1 o'clock p.m. and a quorum is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a post-referral review of South Richmond authorizations in Staten Island Community Board 3, uh, Community <coughs> District 3. Um, making her first presentation to the commission is Angela Koo. Welcome. It just takes a minute to get up. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is an application by the New York City Department of Sanitation to expand the existing Staten Island District 3 garage and Richmond Borough Repair Shop and construct a new building for the relocated Staten Island District 1 garage on a 13.6 acre city owned parcel within the boundary of the closed Fresh Kills landfill in Staten Island. To facilitate the expansion and relocation, DSNY will need special South Richmond Development District authorizations for tree removal, modification of topography, and modification of group parking facility and access regulations. This application relates to the city's commitment to relocate the Staten Island District 1 garage from the Tompkinsville neighborhood of Community Board 1 to Fresh Kills Park by 2023, as discussed in the city's points of agreement for the Bay Street Corridor rezoning and approved by City Council on June 6, 2019. The proposed relocation site consists of the existing District, Staten Island District 3 garage and Richmond Borough Repair Shop and is bounded by the West Shore Expressway to the east. The surrounding area is mainly land from the former Fresh Kills landfill, which is currently in the process of being capped and turned into Fresh Kills Park. The site for the existing Staten Island District 3 garage and Richmond Borough Repair Shop covers 13.6 acres with access to West, Shore, West Service Road via Muldoon Avenue. The proposal includes the construction of a new 134,348 square foot building to house both Staten Island District 1 and 3 garages and the construction of a 6,751 square foot enclosed salt shed. The existing garage facility will be renovated. In total, the site would have 197 vehicle storage spaces and 203 off-street parking spaces, 86 more than the existing 117 parking spaces. A sanitary force main would be installed south along Muldoon Avenue and connect to the sanitary sewer line beneath Arthur Kill Road. To facilitate the project, CPC authorizations are required to permit the modification of topography by more than two feet to fill in an artificial drainage ditch and level the site for vehicle parking and storage. The removal of seven trees with calibers between six and eight inches at the southwest corner of the site and for a parking facility proposing more than 30 accessory off-street parking spaces. This application was referred out to Staten Island Community Board 3 and was approved at the full board meeting on February 25th, 2020, with 25 votes in favor and one vote in opposition. Thank you. Questions from the commission. Okay, then we will schedule this item for a vote on Wednesday. Thank you. The second item on our agenda, page 26, is a non ULERP referral of an authorization in Manhattan Community District 1. Here to present is Connor Clark. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is a private application by Intergate Manhattan LLC, which seeks a parking authorization for a 15 space accessory garage at 375 Pearl Street, located just north of the Brooklyn Bridge in Manhattan Community District 1. The zoning authorization allows an off-street parking facility in the Manhattan core with a maximum capacity of 15 spaces in an existing building developed without the provision of parking. The building, also known as the Verizon Building, was originally constructed in 1975 as a 32-story telephone switching control center without any off-street parking spaces. The applicant renovated the building in 2016, and it now has numerous tenants, including New York City government offices. The applicant also seeks an authorization to construct a new curb cut on a wide street to access the parking spaces. The development site, which is coterminous with the project area, consists of the blocks surrounded by Pearl Street to the east, Madison Street to the north, and Avenue of the Finest to the west. 
This block includes 375 Pearl Street, outlined in red on the map, and Murray Bertram High School, which is located right here. The first authorization request under 13442 would allow for the conversion of one of three loading bays into a 7,900 square foot unattended off street ground floor 15 space garage. The second authorization requested under 13441 would allow for the installation of a new curb cut on Avenue of the Finest, a wide street. Currently, there is a 60 foot wide curb cut that serves three loading bays in the building. If granted the authorization, the applicant would eliminate this curb cut and replace it with one 32 foot five inch curb cut for the two loading bays and a 22 foot wide curb cut for the garage. The parking spaces would be leased to office tenants including the NYPD, the Department of Finance, the Department of uh, Citywide Administrative Services, and the Human Resources Administration. The building is located in an NYPD lockdown zone with checkpoints closing off vehicle access to Avenue of the Finest and several surrounding streets. The department does not anticipate any major on-street vehicle congestion issues or traffic conflicts associated with the garage. The sidewalks in the area are open to the public and pedestrian counts conducted by the applicant show low volumes along Avenue of the Finest, so the department anticipates a low probability of driver conflicts with pedestrians. The area map shows the development site is located next to the Brooklyn Bridge in a C64 zoning district, which has a maximum permitted FAR of 10. There is an R72 zoning district east of the development site with a C15 with C15 commercial overlays. Further north is a C61 zoning district. Areas south and west of the Brooklyn Bridge are located within the special Lower Manhattan district. The development site is surrounded by a mix of uses, including one police plaza to the north, located here and NYCHA's Alfred E. Smith houses to the east, over here. Approaches and ramps to the Brooklyn Bridge are located south and west of the development site. The area is well served by public transit with the Brooklyn Bridge City Hall station served by the 4, 5, 6, J and Z trains and the Fulton Street station served by the two and three trains. Several local and express bus routes serve the area but do not run along Avenue of the Finest where the garage entrance is located. There are also no bike lanes on this street. These site photos show the entrance to one way westbound Avenue of the Finest on Pearl Street. The Verizon building appear <coughs> the Verizon building appears in the photo on the left. The photo on the right is a close up of the NYPD checkpoint for all vehicles entering the avenue. The photo on the left shows the access area with the loading docks looking east. So you can see the loading docks here. The photo on the right shows the proposed off-street parking facility outlined in red. You can also see the existing 60-foot wide curb cut in this photo along here. This curb cut would essentially be split in two separate curb cuts. There would be very little change to the existing streetscape except for the addition of a speed bump and striping in the driveway. This site plan shows the development site. 375 Pearl is in gray in the center of the plan. Avenue of the Finest is one way westbound along the left side of the drawing, going this way. The school is at the top. Uh, Madison Street runs along the right side of the plan and turns into Rose Street under the Brooklyn Bridge, proceeds along this direction. Uh, and that Rose Street and the Brooklyn Bridge is the main exit for vehicles leaving the area. The streets here basically function as an NYPD parking lot. The garage entrance and the NYPD checkpoint are on the left-hand side of this drawing uh, located down here. Uh, while the streets have checkpoints, pedestrians have access all around the site. This shows the parking plan on the ground floor of 375 Pearl Street. After getting through the NYPD checkpoint, cars would proceed west and turn right over the new curb cut. So they'd come up here and turn right into the garage. Cars would drive on the left-hand side of the driveway to access the intercom and swipe pad. Drivers would swipe an electronic key card, <clears throat> which would open the garage door. Cars would then proceed through the one-way entrance and park in one of the 15 spaces. Exiting cars would proceed to the sensor, uh, which, would, which is located here. 
uh, which would trigger the door to, the door to open. Uh, this would also trigger a stop signal in the entrance lane preventing any entering cars from proceeding. This is necessary because the entrance is 14 feet wide, which is not wide enough to accommodate two drive lanes. There were two recent actions at 375 Pearl Street. In 2017, the CPC approved certifications by DCAS to acquire office space for city agencies and for the redesign of an existing plaza and the elimination of non-bonus open areas. This was part of the rehabilitation of the Verizon building to accommodate new commercial tenants and government agencies, including DOF and DCAS. The parking spaces would serve employees of these new tenants. The applicant seeks two authorizations, the first to allow for 15 accessory spaces. The findings include that the entrances and exits will not interrupt pedestrian traffic or the efficient functioning of streets or contribute to traffic congestion and that the facility is consistent with the existing streetscape. The findings for the second authorization for the curb cut in a wide street mirror much of the same language as the first authorization. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Bernie. Um, could you go back to slide six? <clears throat> so, so that looks like the DOT pavement plan, and I see there's quite a lot of sidewalk improvement there, including tree planting and other plantings. Is that all part of the application? Or is there a commitment to do that planting? No, that's not part of the application. Um, I'm assuming that that's uh, part of the uh, plaza redesign and the renovation of the building, but I can get back to you. I can ask the applicant. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Veloz. Um, how did they come up with the number 15? It would be helpful to understand that. Um, it's a large building. I'm imagining there might be more demand. It might also be that there's just no more room in the space that they're considering. It would be, be helpful to understand how they got to that number. That's the maximum under this authorization. Under this particular authorization. So the, the space it would, uh, it, there's more demand and the space would allow for more, so it's a matter that this authorization limits it to 15. Uh, I, I don't know what the demand is, but um, I'm we assuming We can ask and then when it comes back. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay, we'll refer this then to the community board for 45 days. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third item on the agenda, page 50, is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 14. Our presenter is Jonah Rogoff. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> this is an application by 1620 Realty Corporation for a zoning map amendment to rezone a portion of a block from an R6A C24 district to an R7D C24 district, and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, or MIH area, to facilitate a nine-story mixed-use development totaling 85 residential units, 21 of which would be affordable, and commercial space on the ground floor. The project area is located in the Ditmas Park neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 14, the surrounding area is largely comprised of residential use, with some commercial and community facility uses nearby. The surrounding area is zoned R3X to the north, R7A to the south and east, and R6A C24 to the west. R3X is a low density residential district characterized by one and two family detached homes. R3X permits a maximum FAR of 0.5, which may be increased by 0.6 with an attic allowance. Buildings may rise to a maximum height of 35 feet. R7A districts permit a maximum FAR of four for residential and community facility uses that may be increased to 4.6 when located within an inclusionary housing area. Buildings have a maximum base height of 75 feet and a maximum building height of 95 feet. R7A districts um, within this area are also located within a voluntary inclusionary housing area. Um, and then R6A districts permit a maximum FAR of three for residential and community facility use and a maximum building height of 75 feet. C24 overlays permit a maximum FAR of two um, when mapped within R6A district. The surrounding area is well served by public transportation and located within the transit zone. The Q subway line has a stop located less than one block west of the project area and in addition, several bus lines run along Cortelu Road. 
In the bird's eye view shown above, uh, we can see that the surrounding area is characterized by primarily low density, one to two family detached homes, and four to eight story multifamily apartment buildings between Cortelieu and Dorchester roads. Just a few site photos. Um, the top left shows a photo of the development site where there's currently a laundromat and supermarket. Um, and then the photo on the upper right kind of shows the uh, Cortelli Road corridor. And then the bottom photo shows the East 16th Street context. The proposed development consists of a nine-story mixed-use building with 85 dwelling units, 21 of which would be designated permanently affordable and ground floor commercial use at 1620 Cortelli Road. The proposed development is expected to rise to a height of 102 feet and contain approximately 83,000 square feet of floor area with an FAR of 5.6, including approximately 73,000 square feet of residential floor area and 10,000 square feet of commercial floor area on the ground floor, approximately 6,000 square feet of which would be used for a supermarket and 3,000 square feet of which would be for other retail use. The proposed development contains 44 accessory parking spaces in the cellar level, accessible via a ramp on East 16th Street. Um, and then the existing supermarket um, is expected to be the new tenant of the, uh, the development as well. To facilitate the proposed development, the applicant requests a zoning map amendment to rezone an R6A C24 district to an R7D C24 district over the northern portion of the block. When mapped with an inclusionary housing area, R7D allows a maximum FAR of 5.6 residential use and a maximum base and building height of 90 feet and 110 feet respectively, which may also be increased by five feet with a qualifying ground floor. Off-street parking is generally required for 50% of the market rate dwelling units and optional for income restricted units within the transit zone. C24 is a commercial overlay that permits a maximum commercial FAR of two and when paired with an R7D district triggers a requirement for the ground floor frontage to be either commercial or community facility use to a depth of 30 feet. The C24 overlay also allows a range of local retail use, um, including neighborhood grocery stores, restaurants, beauty parlors, um, all with a generally low parking requirement. In addition, the applicant seeks a zoning text amendment to create an MIH area um, with options one and two, coterminous with the project area. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. I'm just curious as to the rationale for the R7D versus the R7A. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, but perhaps. Um, according to the applicant, given the proximity to the subway, less than a, a block away, um, was a major consideration. Um, but I can follow up yeah, with the team as well. I think and, it's a little aggressive mm -hmm. for that site, the R7D. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Well, I actually had exactly the same question, so thanks for asking it. And it would be interesting to hear what the community um, comes back with, what they think about this um, context. Um, <laughs> I have a question about the ground floor, um, mm -hmm. whether they're designing it as a qualifying ground floor and whether this might be a location for a fresh bonus. From the plans we have, it doesn't look like it's a qualifying ground floor. but. Uh, maybe we can hear more about that when it comes back. They are designing the ground floor to be a, a 20 foot floor to ceiling height. Sure. Um, but I can confirm if it's if it meets the qualifying ground floor. And then with respect to the fresh, um, this is outside of this the zoning. This is not a fresh area, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Velahuz. Well, you answered one of my questions during your presentation, which was what's gonna happen to the existing supermarket. So the plan is for them to come back. That's, that's helpful to know. Um, I'm actually interested, and I don't know that this is so much the applicant, or, although it might be, um, you know, g given the fact that this area was rezoned relatively recently, um, and uh, it was um, it was mapped with voluntary inclusionary, is that right? The area just to the south and okay. west. Okay, well, be, I think it'd be helpful to know how many voluntary projects have actually happened in the area. Um, I know a lot of um, neighborhoods with this size stock, there hasn't necessarily been a huge uptake on the voluntary, but meanwhile there's a huge demand for affordable housing. So it would be helpful to, to know more about that as, as part of this process. Absolutely. Thanks. Other questions? 
Commissioner Burney. So, uh, of the 85 units, how many become affordable? Or su 21. 21. 21. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Commissioner Rumpershot. Uh, quick question. The public terrace that we see on these plans that were given to us, that's for the entire building? I take it the residents of the building? The upper floor terrace on the, yeah, on on the, the ninth floor? On our handout, A6.0. I'm just curious. I just want to confirm. It says public terrace, so I don't know. The other floors say private terrace, so I'm just uh, we wondering. will we'll confirm with the applicant team. And if possible, can we get the roof plans since they have the recreation proposed on the roof? Uh, sure, we'll Thank follow you. up with them. Thanks, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Since you mentioned um, the subway as a rationale um, for the the height and the bulk we see here, is that um, I'm looking. I don't know this area particularly well, but um, on the area map, is the subway delineated, or can we see that distance and how that is in context to some of the other land use? Sure. Um, just um, to confirm, do you mean the distance as far as? The, yeah. Where where's the, the intersection of the the subway if it's not on the map? It's on um, the area map. I think I'll just quickly. Well, actually, here you oh, can there, see there, yeah. the the uh, Cortelli Road entrance is Got it. less than a block away. Okay, that's and helpful. I think we have it. Oh, okay. Right there as well. Great, thank you. Other questions? Okay, the application is certified. The fourth item on our agenda, page 77, is a pre-hearing review of a UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned property in Brooklyn Community District 4. Our presenter is Lilia Carrier. Good afternoon. This is an application by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development for UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of a vacant city-owned lot to facilitate the construction of a four-story residential building, eight units of affordable home ownership housing. The proposed development is located in the eastern part of Bushwick in Community District 4. The project site is located on Chauncey Street between Bushwick Ave, just to the north, and Broadway to the south. Broadway is the main commercial thoroughfare in the area with the elevated rail running its length. The, there are several institutions and public facility uses adjacent to the project site. The area is well used and served by transit, um, as you can see on the map. Um, the site is two blocks from the Jay-Z Chauncey Street train station on Broadway and less than half a mile from the L train Bushwick Ave Aberdeen station and the LJZA C trains at Broadway Junction. Local bus services include the B60, which travels along Cooper Street, and Brockway Avenue, and the B20 and Q24, which travel along Broadway. The surrounding area consists of primary low and medium density residential, apart uh, residential apartment buildings with a mix of two and three story row houses and six story multifamily apartment buildings. The area is within an R6 district, a medium density district, um, and R6 quality housing regulations allow for a maximum of 2.2 FAR for residential uses located on narrow streets and a max with a maximum base height of 45 feet with a 15 foot setback on narrow streets before reaching the maximum building height of 55 feet. C13 and C23 commercial overlays are mapped along Broadway. The proposed development site is coterminous with the project area and located at 641 Chauncey Street. The site is located on the west side of Chauncey Street, which is a narrow street. Immediately south is the Eddie Harris Residential Facility, a men's only shelter run by the Bushwick Economic Development Cor Corporation. Immediately north is Moffat Gardens, an assisted living facility for seniors, which is owned and operated by Riseboro. Just north is the Bushwick Multi-Service Center, which is housed uh, which houses the Community Board 4, the RHA's development, Department of Social Services, and a food pantry. The site consists of a vacant mid-block city-owned tax lot of approximately 4,375 square feet and approximately 35 feet 
uh, lot frontage along Chauncey Street and approximately 125 feet of depth. The, the development will be a four-story building with eight affordable home ownership dwelling units. The unit mix will be four one-bedrooms, two two-bedrooms, and two three-bedrooms and, and approximately 8,220 square feet of residential floor area. The development will reach the maximum FAR of 2.2, allowed under the quality housing of R6, uh, with a total height of 40 feet. The front of the building will be set back five feet from the lot line and aligned with the adjacent building to the south. Uh, there will be landscaping in the front to buffer between the street and the residential units. The rear yard will be planted and seeded with grass and accessible to the building residents through the first floor. On December 18th, the community board voted to approve the application with conditions. There were 25 in favor, none in opposition, and one abstaining. The conditions included um, that the applicant disclose if they would be taking a developer fee, to provide resources to bridge the gap between HPD's Home First program and AMI levels, to market the units locally, and to commit to permanent affordability. Uh, the BP hearing was held on November 13th and voted to approve with conditions. The conditions included to ensure permanent affordability, add additional units at 80 to 90% AMI, utilize locally based affordable housing nonprofits to assist with the lottery, um, incorporate resiliency and sustainability measures, and coordinate with DEP, DOT, and parks to install tr street cheese. And that concludes my presentation. Questions from the commission? Okay, that, oh, Commissioner Levin. Um, I did have a question when this was certified that I hope maybe um, the applicant can tell us about um, at the hearing, and that is about the treatment of the sidewall, particularly the one um, closer to the senior building, um, yes. which will be remain exposed. I have flagged that for them, so I will um, make sure that it's addressed. Thank you. Other comments? We'll see this then at a public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. The fifth item on our agenda, page 104, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 12. Our presenter is San Martinac. Good afternoon. This is an application by SCUW4 LLC for a zoning map amendment to rezone from R5 to R6 C24 and a zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area to facilitate a new nine-story mixed-use development with approximately 47,500 square feet of total area, which would also include 36 residential units, 11 of which would be affordable housing. The development site is located along Bay Parkway in Mapleton neighborhood in Brooklyn's Community District 12. The proposed development site, which is also the proposed rezoning area, is uh, located just a few blocks south of the Washington Cemetery. The surrounding uh, land uses is a mix of low-rise residential uses. To its uh, eastern side is a one-storied commercial uses, and just south are a variety of community facility uses, including a nine-story medical office building, which is immediately adjacent south, and also um, uh, um, the public schools and a house of worship. The development uh, at the previous, uh, at, during certification, we did not have the renderings which the applicant has provided. So the development uh, includes a nine-story mixed-use development with ground floor commercial, second floor community facility, and residential uses above. The total development would contain approximately 47,500 square feet and 6,200 square feet of commercial floor area and a second story of community facility, approximately 6,600 square feet. The total units would be 36, 11 of which will be affordable housing. So these are the images which are from uh, 60th Street, looking um, from the western edge of the property. So the community board on January 23rd 
um, held a public hearing on this application and on January 28th recommended approval with conditions by a vote of 29 in favor, one opposed and zero abstaining. The only condition was that applicant provide additional parking spaces and the developer has committed to providing over 10 uh, additional parking spaces. Borough President held a public hearing on January 29, 2020, and on February 19, issued the following recommendations. The conditions are prior to considering application, city council should obtain the following applicants from the applicant clarifying how it would. And uh, just to summarize very quickly, it would um, it is about memorializing a bedroom mix. The second one is about combination of locally based affordable housing development nonprofits to serve as administrators administering agents, then setting aside a portion for cultural and arts activities, then memorializing uh, uh, resiliency and sustainable measures, and lastly, retain Brooklyn-based contractors and subcontractors, including MWBEs. So that concludes uh, this presentation. The uh, developer has also uh, given answers in response to the questions which were raised at public hearing, borough presidents, and if there are any questions, I can um, read that out. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Tweck. Uh, did the applicant respond uh, in regard to the request of the bedroom mix? Um, um, not not the, uh, the bedroom mix, no. And we can, I've informed the applicant, but they did respond to the other measures saying they are, they are open to considering most of the other measures. Yeah, okay. Com Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, do you have any insight into the land use rationale around, you know, the, uh, it's quite a bit of commercial um, and community facility um, there. I know there's some stuff around it, but, um, What's the, that I means previously residential, so why should we? Uh, um, so this, um, intersection? And I can uh, just use a slide which was used previously. So this is uh, the context, the built context, and this is, this shows uh, the intersection, which is a 60 uh, feet, uh, the site is at the intersection of two major thoroughfares. Bay Parkway is a 100 feet wide um, mixed use corridor and 60th Street is a 80th feet wide corridor. And also it's just two blocks uh, to the west of McDonald Avenue, which is another major corridor. So in terms of Bay Parkway, the mixed use development fits, uh, fits fine. And also there were questions regarding density previously and because of the two subway stations, which are just within half a mile, um, the applicant has uh, argued that this density is appropriate for this location. Okay, so the, I understand the rationale for the ground floor. For the second floor is community space as opposed to a more residential. So I believe that the there is a, like just south of the development site, there is a existing uh, nine story uh, medical office building. Mm -hmm. So this uh, area does have a demand for medical offices. Um, however, in response to Borough President's comments regarding cultural and arts uh, activities, the applicant has said that if there is interest, they are willing to consider that. Sure, but they wouldn't be obligated. No, they wouldn't be. Um, okay, do they have, um, uh, what falls under community facility that is, is uh, affiliated with medical uses? I'm not sure about that. I mean, you said that they see, what's that? Clinics. Oh, doctor's offices are considered yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was my question. Oh, Thank okay. you. Other questions? Commissioner De La Uh maybe, maybe I missed it, um, but if, if either now or at the hearing, if they could um, speak to the rationale for the workforce option versus serving the folks in the community where we're about 50% of AMI. Yeah, th be helpful. that's something which we have asked repeatedly and I, the only response which I know is that the community board and the council member, they are, there are no objections and so that's all I know. I hear that when you look at the AMI in the community though, it's, yeah. it's not matching. Yeah. Commissioner Bernie. Um, could you just go to the main rendering, the, any of them? That's fine. I mean, w with ground floor commercial, you would normally expect to see a different design for the base where the fenestration would be more appropriate for a commercial use, and yet it just looks like another floor of residential. So I'm wondering, I assume that's not the final design, so could they speak to why it's like that way? I will pass that. Yeah, thank you. 
other questions, we'll see this at the public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. The sixth item on the agenda, page 129, is a pre-hearing review of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 3. Our presenter is Matthew Pietras. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a private application for a zoning special permit to transfer floor area from a landmark to a proposed development at, C at 3 St. Mark's Place. And uh, for heightened setback waivers to accommodate the additional floor area. As you may recall, the project is located on the corner of 3rd Avenue and St. Mark's Place, shown in red, and the landmark site is shown across the street in blue. On the left of the screen is the development site, which is comprised of three tax lots, and it's currently vacant. On the right is the landmark building. The proposed development would be a new 10-story office building with ground floor retail and setbacks at the 4th, 7th, 9th, and 10th floors. The development site has been located in a C61 district since 1961, where the permitted as of right FAR is 6. However, a condition of the 7479 special permit allows that bulk to increase by 20% to an FAR of 7.2, and that's the proposed FAR of the building. In order to construct the building, the applicant is seeking a special permit to first allow for the transfer of floor area from a landmark, um, and then second, to modify height and setback regulations in order to accommodate that additional bulk. The first part of the 7479 special permit would allow for the transfer of about 8,600 square feet of unused floor area from the landmark to the development site. As a condition of this transfer, the landmark site would be restored to a sound first class condition and as part of the project there would also be a continuing maintenance plan that binds the owner and future owners of the landmark to maintain it. That restoration work and the maintenance plan have been approved by the LPC. The second part of the special permit allows the commission to permit bulk modifications to accommodate the additional floor area while ensuring that it remains compatible with the landmark. On 3rd Avenue, which is a wide street, the building would be compliant, but along St. Mark's, the applicants seek to modify required setbacks, which are shown in red. The building's initial setback is at 63 feet, which is a little more than 20 feet shorter than what is permitted. This reduction in front wall height is meant to match the existing buildings along St. Mark's, including the landmark, which rises to about 64 feet. At 85 feet, the building is required to set back 20 feet on a narrow street, then follow the sky exposure plane. On St. Mark's, the building sets back nine feet at 63 feet, but then rises to 108 feet. At 108 feet, the building sets back 15 feet and then rises to 139 feet. And at 139 feet, the building then sets back 28 feet, which is then compliant. In short, the applicants are seeking a bulk waiver for height and required setback from the middle of the sixth floor to the ninth floor at a depth of 20 feet. During public review, Community Board 3 voted to disapprove the application, believing that the increase in bulk was incompatible with the neighborhood context and was not justified by the improvements to the landmark. Uh, the borough president uh, recently issued her recommendation for disapproval as well. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I'd be interested on Wednesday in hearing the applicant discuss with us um, the two things. One is how this, and I know we're not a design review board and that the LPC has already approved this, but how this design relates to St. Mark's Place. Um, it is true that on the um, Western side, this ties quite well to larger scale development um, to the West, but St. Mark's Place is a gateway to a lower scale historic district. And I know they've been trying to balance these issues, but if they could articulate a little bit the thought that went into how to fit this into the St. Mark's Place um, approach, um, that would be great. And then also, I, I understand that there is a certain amount of landmark um, preservation work that the, that the landmark owner has, the owner of the landmark building has undertaken independent of this project that I think has been recently completed. And then there's another chunk of work that's proposed to be done in conjunction with this as a part of this application. If they could um, give us some illustrations of the before, during, and after um, I think that would 
help sure. understand what's really going on in this yeah. application. I, so I know this is, that I can certainly have them speak a little bit more to that because yeah. it is, there's a certain timeline that they'll be better, better able to explain. Uh, but this table kind of breaks down what was done, and I'm, my apologies, it's a little short, hopefully you can see it on your screens. Um, but the previous work that was done is on the, the left-hand side of the screen, um, and those were approved as part of a Certificate of Appropriateness in 2017. Um, so that Certificate of Appropriateness was amended in 2018, and, and that was in anticipation of this special permit, not necessarily anticipating approval, but wanting to, the landmark owner wanted to get that work done as it was moving forward and didn't really want to wait. So that Certificate of Appropriateness was then amended in 2018, and so that's what's in the middle, what has been done. And then the proposed work um, pending approval is in the far right screen. So you can kind of see uh, that the windows would be redesigned to match historic details. The dormers would be redesigned. Um, the door surround, the fan light, entry door, areaway stoop. A lot of these um, you can kind of see here. The differences on the left which is what is under the amended C of A. And then this is what would be done in the future. So it's kind of just bringing it back to what it was um, back when Alexander J Sam Hamilton's son lived there. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. I realize now we have those on page 19 and 20. They're buried at the, at the back of the at, at the back of the um, presentation. So so thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the crux of it is for me. Um, is that you know under the findings we have to find whether the dis disadvantages to the surrounding area caused by. Um, well, reduced access to light and air, that's kind of a term of art, um, are more than offset by the advantages of the work being done to this um, landmark. So Absolutely. we'll have to drill into what those, how to weigh the, what, what those items are and how to weigh them. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions or comments? Okay, <clears throat> another item for Wednesday's public hearing. Thank you. For March 4th, uh, staff have prepared reports for 50 Old Fulton, uh, 364 Avenue of the Americas. Um, I will note that 40 Yalmalt appeared on um, this agenda, but is actually not scheduled for a decision until March 18th. Um, also for decision on March 4th, uh, 526 Drum Ghoul Road East. 445 Ellsworth Avenue, 64 Glover Street, and then also, oh, 94, yes, thank you, 94 Glover Street, and then also the DSNY Staten Island Garage and Borough Repair Shop, which we saw at the top of the agenda today. For post-hearing follow-up, um, the Union Square South Hotel Special Permit, um, I'm noting that this appears in the calendar for decision on March 4th, but we will lay that over um, to the 18th for a decision. This is, yeah, Union Square South. Yeah, it was it was scheduled for the fourth for decision, and now it's yeah we're yeah. I just ahead. want to indicate for my colleagues, I plan to vote no on this one because I think um, it from the hearing it really became clear to me that this is an, an imperfect and a political solution to re what is really not a zoning problem. So, just saying. Okay. Um, and for 266 West 96th Street, uh, Andy uh, Cantu is here to discuss a letter that was in your package on Friday. Hi, good afternoon. Um, as you might remember at the public hearing on this item on January 22nd, uh, the commission had additional questions about the My Micro New York pilot project, also known as Mount Carmel Place, um, which was approved in 2013 and then completed in 2016. As part of those approvals, HPD agreed to uh, evaluate how that project performed in relation to uh, furthering affordability and increasing density in established neighborhoods. Um, HPD provided a very high level report uh, in a letter dated February 11th, which I described briefly at review session on February 12th. Uh, and based on additional feedback uh, from that review session, HPD has agreed to undertake uh, more detailed research on the Mount Carmel Place project and to deliver a report to commission within six months. And additional details and next steps were included in your packet. 
And I want to thank Commissioner Levin for having reminded us of that, which was contained in the report. It was a project that was approved right at the end of the prior administration and got lost in the handover. I wouldn't call um, the one page that HPD had submitted was a report. There was a recognition that a report needs to be done, and we thought it, re we thought it made sense to give them six months to do a serious report and then come back to us. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that this has been taken up and that this work will be done, and I'm sorry I wasn't here at the, at the last review session to, to chime in. Um, but as I recall, the thing we were worried about in 2013 was not so much about the affordable units. It's important to know um, what the uptake has been with the affordable units and the persistence of tenants in those spaces, but I think the preliminary and superficial information we got in the first letter makes it clear that there was a robust market and appetite for those units. But we were also really worried, the argument was, that we needed to provide um, more housing for s singles, particularly single seniors, and that, there were, that these micro units were going to be um, an important additional tool in the creation of housing, not just affordable housing, but housing for all. And what many people were worried was that this was going to be actually not used for people who needed that kind of housing, but transient housing. Um, students who would rotate in and out, maybe um, pied a terres, um, you know, not the kinds of uses that we were necessarily targeting um, in the application. So I hope that HPD will be able to get some information on that point as well. I know they're not usually in the business of studying um, tenancies in market rate units, but that's what we were worried about is. Okay, I'll relay that to HPD. Okay, thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you for clarifying that. And I don't know if any of the rest of you who are around remember it, if, if there were other things that we were concerned about. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Veluz. Uh, that, that is also consistent with my recollection. I mean, I, I think it'll be interesting, I think, to see when the report comes back um, what the uptake is also going back to the affordable side and how that might vary by AMI level. Right. Um, I think I think getting a like a demographic profile of the tenants and the turnover of units, right. regardless of whether it's affordable or, or market. market rate, will help us determine whether or not it's actually this model is actually helping to address a need uh, that we were trying to figure out in terms of our housing need and gap. Yes. The one thing I will caution is, as we know, getting information about individual tenancies um, is generally more protected, but we'll pass along the intent of what it was that the commission, the, the issue right. that we were trying to dig into at the time. Well, and the advantage here is that it's still under the same ownership, um, and the owner has been presumably understanding what kind of tenancies are coming and going, so maybe we can get more information than we might ordinarily get. Commissioner Dweck. I would just note that our toolbox has been updated since then with the creation of MIH, so, I mean, things have changed. Well, yeah, and that's exactly the point, because in this 96th Street application, the MIH is to be taken up with these micro units, so right. Right. we want to be sure it works. Right. Even though we're voting before we get the report, but still. <laughs> That was the imperfect world we were faced with. But again, thank you for calling that out because I do think it gives us the opportunity, albeit belatedly, to learn about this, this new housing stock. Yeah. Other questions? Right. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, Wheatsville, uh, the neighborhood, uh, what is it, NCP, I'm not quite, I know the acronym, but I don't recall, but I, Ah, neighborhood Construction Program, thank you, Commissioner, at Prospect Place. Um, and then, no issues on that, okay. Uh, and then, then on Industry City, I will just relay that staff is working with the applicant on a full response, um, and we'll have that on March 16th. But if there are any further questions or reflections that we want to pass on to staff and the applicant. Okay. Before I'll anybody note, does that, I'll say I'm going to accuse myself on this matter. Oh, oh, Thank you. Yes. And I'll also note that um, we have until April 6th, so there will be at least two review sessions to be able to discuss it. Okay. All right. That's, that concludes uh, this review session um, on March 2nd. The time is 1.49 p.m. In 50 minutes. <laughs>